Afghanistan 2009, the front line in the war against the Taliban. One of the most dangerous environments in the world and home to 8,300 British troops. For these combat forces, there is the ever-present risk of injury and death. Uh, Roger, over. Just a big explosion and then uh, didn't know what was really going on and we heard medic. The first thing that came to my mind was, I don't want to be here. But among the thousands of armed soldiers, there is one group of men whose only weapon is the Bible. These are the Royal Navy chaplains. Welcome to my parish. These are my parishioners. I do this not for myself, but in God's name. So let us pray. But what has prayer got to do with war? To the Taliban who believe in a holy war, the answer is obvious. But the British armed forces? Do they need men of God on the front line? Methodist Bill Gates was ministering in rural Dorset. Today, having been through the full six-month Green Beret commando training course, he is part of a small group of chaplains bringing the church to the British Armed Forces in Afghanistan. As a chaplain, you've got people thinking about the essentials, the vitality of life. And a lot of the guys have dealt with their friends dying. Suddenly, I think people think differently and become aware of what's important. Bill's base for part of his tour of duty is Camp Bastion. In 2006, they built this base from scratch in the middle of the desert, where the Taliban find it difficult to attack. It is here, in the main logistical hub for the British Armed Forces in Afghanistan, that the two army and seven Royal Navy chaplains have their home. Cheers, mate. Nigel Beardsley is an ordained priest in the Church of England. I'm currently serving as a Royal Naval Chaplain with the Royal Marine Command Support Group. Five years ago, Nigel left his vicarage near the city of Bath to take the first steps which see him today in Afghanistan with the Royal Navy. If you go back First World War, they, they will say you'll never find an atheist in the trenches. I'm here to provide uh, the moral compass for, for the command, uh, for the lads themselves. The kind of conversations begin with, I, I don't really, I don't go to church, uh, Padre, but... For Nigel and for Bill, Camp Bastion is where they are able to keep in touch with chaplains from all the other armed forces. It's also their moment of calm before they go out into the field. Come on, guys. Come on. Get the rifles in the middle. We'll dance around the rifles. Hey, yeah. Look at that. Good. Okay. I was all right. It was fine until I had the hips replaced. And then, oh, yeah, then it. Go for it, brother. Whenever we are in base, all the padres and chaplains meet together 12 noon in this church or just outside for midday prayer. And it's a chance for us to, to group together, find out what we've been doing, where we've been going and then pray for each other and everybody else on the base. Shall we pray? Why not? Almighty God, we bring before you each other in our roles in this environment. You'll see a difference here straight away in that uh, army chaplains carry rank and uh, Navy chaplains don't in the Royal Navy. The chaplain adopts the rank of who they talk to. That means that the lowest Marine at 4-5 and talk to me at the same level as the most senior officer. So no one can talk down to me. And uh, I don't talk up to anyone. The British troops in Afghanistan are on a six-month tour of duty. 
the soldiers are often isolated, under immense stress, and cut off from their families and loved ones. The chaplains of the Royal Navy had expected to take their ministry to the men on the very front line, whatever the danger. British troops were deployed in Afghanistan in 2001 in support of a UN-sanctioned mission to capture Osama bin Laden and topple the hardline terrorist Islamic regime of the Taliban. Today, the majority of British troops are stationed in Helmand province, where most of the fighting takes place. They operate from garrisons in towns and villages and have bases along the river and frontline positions in Taliban-held territory. For the Taliban, this is a holy war, a clash of Islamic and Christian civilizations, and the British troops, along with the chaplains who serve them, are portrayed as the new crusaders. Here in Musakala, Nigel is hitching a ride with a supply convoy. He's heading for an isolated patrol base that guards a vital radio communication tower. I have a choice, be in the front or next to the ammo. In the past, convoys were regularly ambushed with machine gun fire and rocket-propelled grenades. The threat still exists, but today the greatest danger comes from mines and IEDs, improvised explosive devices. If we do get hit, it's normally the front vehicle that gets it worse, so we need to check on the driver, commander and the one passenger in there. Nobody steps out until these have checked the back door on the barber, and then it's just uh, QBOs on the ground. Happy? Happy. Excellent. Do you find the troops you go out with are protective of you because of who you are, or do they tend to forget you? Initially, they're, they're very twitchy. Yeah. Very twitchy. Uh, I think they're just worried, because I, I don't carry a weapon. And is that your choice not to carry a weapon, is it? No, we, we don't carry. I thought you carried one for personal protection. No. And you're all right with that? Yeah, I'm a first and foremost. Um, um, a minister in the Church of England. Even if I had the choice, I don't think I'd be very happy carrying anything. No? Because to be that kind of confident as to who I am. I don't think I would be happy with that somehow. Thank you, sir. Thank you, mate. The radio tower is based on a mountaintop overlooking a valley that until last year was controlled by the Taliban. Since then, the British forces and the Afghan National Army have forced the Taliban further north, and they can now risk foot patrols. The civilian population has slowly returned, but there is still a risk of Taliban infiltration. No one, least of all a man with a Bible, is entirely safe here. It is a world away from Royal Navy Chaplain Nigel Beardsley's old parish in Bath. I never envisaged my ministry with, with the armed forces. My curacy had, had ended in, in Bath, and many of the people in the congregation had served with the Royal Navy and said I would make a great chaplain. And eventually, uh, I decided to have a look at it. It's a, it's a strange thing. God will get you where he wants you. To actually come out here and be prepared is almost an impossibility. You just have to kind of accept what comes your way, take a deep breath, and then go forward. And you have to accept it is a vocation. I do this not for myself, but in God's name and in the name of Jesus Christ. Having said that, you've got to have a certain degree of fitness and resilience. Being in a, in a FOB or in a PB out of a Russian pack is not the highlight of the day, day after day after day. But it's what everybody else is suffering, and you suffer it with them. Nigel's unit, the command support group, has individual soldiers everywhere in Helmand. So because of his own travels, he has become a valuable link with the unit's lieutenant colonel back at base, Andrew McInerney. The command support group has some 900 people, and those people are in every single forward operating base, and they're in every single uh, PB out across Helmand. 
I'm not able to get out as much as I would like. Uh, so having people like Nigel, like a padre, is absolutely critical to enable me to understand what's going on with the people in the unit. When I arrive somewhere, I just go around, try and chat to them, make my presence known, and then if, if they really want a private word, uh, if they'll ask me later if they can uh, just have a quiet chat. You right? What are we doing, just setting up? Oh, we're just uh, going through some targets. These oh, guys right. have just come in. So... Oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> hey. When you say just come in, from where? Uh, Fob Eddie. All right. Yeah. Oh, it's there at Christmas. Oh, yeah. Where were you? R&R. &R. <laughs> yeah. I, I had a feeling you were going to say that, because I can't recall you. I don't, I, I don't want to put you off or anything, but it's in the opposite direction, mate. <laughs> when they suss you out, and once they've sussed you out, yeah, they will come. They know they can talk to us confidentially. And it is a release for them just to sit and tell us their issues. There may not be an answer to these issues at all, but it's just the fact they've been able to speak to somebody knowing it's not going to go down on record or people are going to think ill of them because they're not going to be able to do their job because they might have a problem. Bill Gates, the Methodist Padre, is heading to Sangam, which until recently was a Taliban stronghold. The fight to capture Sangam proved to be one of the hardest battles of the war. Over a thousand NATO and Afghan troops, including four two-commander Royal Marines, were involved in the fight to drive out the Taliban. At one point, 16 British troops were killed in the space of a few weeks. Now the area is under the control of British forces, but many who fought in the battle struggle to come to terms with the loss of comrades. Gentlemen. They have asked Bill to come and hold a memorial service to mark the anniversary of their deaths. This is my bed space. Wherever I go, I take communion wine with, with me so that I'm, I'm free to do a service as and when. I've got copies of the old commando prayer book. Before I came out here, I, I laminated some service sheets as a, as a Royal Navy chaplain, although I'm a Methodist, all are welcome to church, and as such, the service I do has uh, elements of liturgy from all denominations. I minister to people of all faith and those of no faith as well. Well, this is the reason why we've come back to Sangin is to do a memorial for 2-9 Commando. Two years ago on Herrick 5, three lads from 2-9 were killed, quite tragically, uh, as we see down here. Ross Clark, Paddy McLaughlin, killed on March the 3rd. And then five days later on the 8th of March, Mick Smith lost his life. So this is the 13th. Battery Sergeant Major Kevin Paneskis and Sergeant Mick Tiller were part of the force that took Sangen and fought alongside those who died. It was their initiative to ask Bill for a memorial service. A grenade came in, and that's where he was killed. He was killed on the step here. Yeah. So unlucky. Massively unlucky. So 13 steps. 13 steps, stay lucky. This is the old rooftop, then. It's where Paddy and Ross died. It's changed a bit since then, hasn't it? Yeah. And a lot of this stuff wasn't here before. A lot of the protection has been built up. 
strikes and stuff here as well. Yeah. It's crosses as well. Yeah, the tribute that uh, one of the lads has felt, felt he should put up. To have memorial services, obviously, it helps us know that if we do, um, if we are killed ourselves, then we can see that other people um, won't, won't forget, forget yeah. won't forget us. Yeah. It doesn't take one service and one ceremony for you to actually come to terms with the fact that somebody's gone. I think it, it, it does take time. The memorial service is particularly poignant for Bill as he helped repatriate the bodies in 2007. Ben, Michael, Ross, Liam, may you go in the name of the Father who created you. We gather to pay our respects, to say our goodbyes, and to thank you, Lord, for the lives of Ross, Paddy, and Mick. It's one of those times where we just stop, think, and remember a friend's past. The end of November, beginning of December, in a space of about 10 days, we lost five blokes and four lads lost limbs. But I found that quite difficult. And quite, quite obviously so, I, I'm only human. I found it difficult because I know the lads and administered the last rites. And as such, I do distinctly recall flying back to Bastion to do the repatriation and sitting before God and, and having nothing to say. I wasn't angry with God. I wasn't losing my faith. But I was tired. I was... Uh, and I had no words to say. I'd run out of words to say to God. Let me not beg for the stilling of pain but for the heart to conquer it. Let me not fail those who have placed their trust in me, but let my green beret remind me daily of the high traditions of commando service. Pray, pray, chun, fall out. Whenever we do a memorial service, the question often comes up, what are we doing here? What are we achieving? Here in Sangin, this is a very different place to two years ago. The town was empty. There was no one there except for Taliban. Here we are now, houses are full, shops are open, and people feel safe. Jesus came to bring sight to the blind, to heal the sick, to set the prisoner free. In the simple words, to, to make a difference. And in order for evil to triumph, good men simply have to do nothing. So I believe we're here as good men and women making a difference. At the end of the day, you don't want to doubt the validity of what you're doing. You don't want to doubt whether or not you're on the right side or the, or the wrong side. You need to have courage in your own convictions. Otherwise, you won't be as effective as a soldier. And to have someone like Bill saying, no, what you are doing is right, what you are doing isn't wrong, um, whether helps. You're, whether you're religious or not. Absolutely. Yeah. Take care. Have a word with St. Peter for me. Part of our, our role here is the moral compass. They know that if, if anything is, is, is amiss, we would say it is our duty. And I, and I, I think this is a slight, slight sense of relief that us being there, they know that, that they are doing the right thing. And we, we actually don't carry any authority. As a chaplain, we can't do any order. However, if anything was seen, that does not comply with the Geneva Conventions, we have a duty to act. Hopefully, I would have the courage to stand up and say, no, I'm sorry, guys, this is not on. We cannot do this. Back at Bastion. I don't have bed spaces all round the 
six locations, four or five commando are at. But the best thing about being at Bastion, apart from the cheesecake, is you can get me mail, get my e blueies. Right, back in a minute. I've managed to catch a lot of a lot of the lads relaxed. If you know what I mean. There's a few Back at Camp Bastion, Bill updates the Royal Navy website, a vital source of information for the families back home. The Royal Marine photographer, Nick Tryon, provides the pictures. What I might do then is just do a smalling, a smally rovy rev. Or roving rev, sorry. Rovy rev. Yeah. Come on, get typing. This is quite an important part of my job, the Royal Navy community website provides a link from here to the folks back home uh, about the silly things the lads get up to, just trying to reassure and allay some of the fears that the families back home may have. And uh, in turn, there's the capability for them to, to send in messages and, and emails to myself and to Nick. He does the fox, I do the dits. Just takes me a while to write them. One of the hardest demands made upon Bill and the other padres is physical fitness. The Royal Navy only accepts chaplains into three commando brigade who are prepared to undergo the same punishing training as the Marines. Some of the lads ask, why did I join up? I never went to university. I spent six years working as a fishmonger, cutting up fish and selling fish. And uh, during those years, I uh, really went through a transition period and ended up eventually being accepted to train as an ordained Methodist minister. Uh, I also used to play rugby quite badly uh, for, for Weymouth. And uh, a few of the lads there were, were Royal Marines and said, uh, why don't you come and join the Corps? I went to Limpston Commando Training Centre, Royal Marines, and it was a hard time. But I think it's put me in good stead because when I went to join 4-5 Commando in the beginning of July 2006, straight away I had something in common with the lads there in that we'd all gone through the, the ardours of Commando training. Are you cracking much, Fizz? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, a lot of the fobs are quite small. What about you? Mainly running machine and cross-trainer. Over the years, I think the church has abused its position and, and let God down, and, and at times held, held the people at arm's length from God. And actually, you know, I, I want to make a difference. God uses all sorts of ministers to, to reach all sorts of people. You have some people who are academic and who, who will teach, you have some people who are great preachers. One of the things I'm good at is doing fizz, and I'm quite happy living out of a Bergen. It's striking this balance between being part of the unit but also being very distinct. Uh, it's nice to, to be part of them and work alongside them. But at the end of the day, I'm not a Royal Marine. I'm a chaplain. For the Royal Navy Padres, the stay in the relative safety of Camp Bastion is never a long one. Nigel is soon back on duty, traveling to patrol base Argyle. The area is dangerous because it is part of the Taliban hinterland. Quite a few of my journeys have been in the back of, of a wagon. You shoot in a box. You, you feel every jolt because you can't see the rope that's coming ahead. You're wearing your body armor. You've got all the weight. You just kind of sat, waiting. Will this be the trip? I used to think that it, it, was, it would be the front vehicle that would always hit a mine, but during this tour, I've had to visit the hospital and see guys who have been in the fourth or fifth vehicle. And you can't help but sense your own mortality. You know, and, and these guys do it day in, day out. Where, where they are, I go. Argyle is a typical frontline post where British troops work alongside soldiers of the Afghan National Army. With their support, three commando brigades pushed forward into this area in October 2008. 
On arriving, Nigel is asked to join a foot patrol into the nearby village. He will be the only man in the patrol without a weapon, and he is committed to not picking one up, even in an emergency. As soon as you pick up a weapon, you, you're a combatant. As tempting as it may be, it's probably best that I relieve a medic or somebody else who is trained in fighting, rather than trying to pick up a weapon that's not set for me, and it'd probably be far greater hindrance than any good whatsoever. We're going to go through a local area, which has a bazaar. I'm, I'm always looking to try and keep in the footsteps of the guy in front, and also look for areas that might be disturbed or, or that may be a risk. I'm eyes and ears as much as anybody else. And in this arena, that's as vital as anybody with a weapon. The gunfire indicates that the Taliban are close, but the local Afghans are clearly not the targets. George, going this way. Going that way. We have got small arms fire over to behind my, me, to my west. Closer out there, mate. Depend on me. Move me, me. Follow on, Padre. Yeah. I've got you. Okay, mate. Follow on. Normally, a walk in these temperatures will be quite nice, but uh, it's exceptionally unnerving. Uh, I have been on a patrol where they faced a suicide bomber. And uh, that has made me very twitchy with regard to anybody who's carrying anything. We are trying to create an area where, where these people can live in peace. We operate to the, what we call the just war theory. Out here in Afghanistan, yes, we've got the Taliban. It would be a very, very broad brush stroke to say they are all evil. But there is a core, you know, like we had in the Second World War, Hitler and, and those around him were leading the others on. Out here, we can see what effect they are having on the local people. And, and we can have seen ourselves with the bombings in London uh, and the Twin Towers, the effect they can have worldwide. We cannot stand by and just let that happen. Back at base, with the mission accomplished, it's time for the soldiers to relax. It's an opportunity, too, for Nigel to get to know the men better. You know this cup of tea? He's, he's, taking, a oh, he's taking a long time, isn't it? You're going to throw that over me as well, are you? More tea, Vicar. More tea. Yeah, here we go. More tea, Vicar. <laughs> Short red, Vicar. Yeah. Short red. They've been here an awful long time, and it's not actually pleasant conditions here. Sometimes it, it, it does get silly. It gets silly and infantile. And sometimes you've just got to say, in this arena, where they're facing patrols day in, day out, uh, round here, I, I, I term it cheeky. <laughs> hey, well, get his hat on. No, 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 I don't know what he's doing. What is he? What are you doing? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. No, no. The trick no, is, no, when it gets no, very, very no, silly, it's being able to leave with grace. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, I've got Padre. See who you got to oh, work nice. with? I oh, know. You've got to work with us, Doc. It's terrible. He's got to work with I've got months, months of work here. Oh, months wow. of work. Right, enough of the stupidity. <laughs> Bill and Nick, the photographer, are on their way to visit X-ray company of 4-5 Commando Royal Marines. Bill trained with many of these men and considers himself to be part of their family. Since he last saw them two months ago, they have suffered several casualties. Oh! What's 
The Nole area not only contains Taliban fighters, it is also controlled by drug traffickers. They are extremely tough opponents for the Royal Marines. Bill is met by Major Richard Maltby, who is the commanding officer of X-Ray Company. We've had our, our ups and downs. We were um, unfortunate enough to be engaged by a suicide IED, which killed three of my men. Uh, and then uh, quite recently, where we're patrolling out into the eastern desert, uh, we lost another Marine, uh, Marine Smith, through um, small arms fire. And it's helpful that Bill does come out uh, to see the men and see what pressure and strains are under. Also, those with religious views can um, go to the service, which you'll hold on Sunday. Building up local infrastructure is an important part of Major Maltby's mission. His engineers recently completed this new bridge, but in the process, they destroyed some fields. And now the locals are asking for compensation. How much do you want for the war? So how many of these shows do you ever attend? Uh, very few. My focus is on, uh, is on you guys. And uh, I never spend long enough in one place to build up relationships with the locals. And well, obviously yourself and Reg and the boss here, you know, the locals know who you are and respect you, whereas I bob around. And actually, I feel it's more important to focus on you. <laughs> Can you tell uh, Jay to stand by with more bags of grain? How many more? Just stand by with more. I've known Bill for a couple of years now. Very supportive. He'll just pull you to the side. He's always got time for you. You don't hold anything back, and he doesn't judge you on it. Every time I see him, like it brings a smile straight away. You just like. Uh, <laughs> you're pretty much like, what is he doing out here? But at the same time, you're just like, yeah, hoof and blow. He's one of us. Bill has good reason to focus on the welfare of his Marines. A few weeks ago, one of them was shot by a sniper. Three others were killed by a 12-year-old boy. He had a wheelbarrow full of explosives. Obviously, that was a mega, mega shock. Everybody wanted, although we knew there was a risk of suicide, the fact that it had actually happened in the use of a boy was atrocious. The thing is, out here, a lot of the younger lads haven't even had death in the family. In the first instance, they've actually felt death at home as being one of, like, the, the, the lads in their troop actually out here. Um, I think some of the young lads as well, I remember we like, spoke, used to speak about in the UK, although you say people will die out here, they probably don't actually think that it is genuinely going to happen to them, and then when it does, it's like, Jesus, this actually goes on. Like When you got hit with the RBG, that was your first Kazi vac out of yeah. the green zone, and uh, when it happened, just big explosion, and then uh, we were just like, what, what? didn't know what was really going on, then we heard medic. He was that badly injured, but the uh, first thing that came to my mind was, I don't want to be here, don't want... Cause we didn't know if there was a second device or not, and it was sort of afterwards when we all got back together, sitting in the TV grot, all the lads sitting around, and uh, just uh, sort of first casually, all the lads were just... Shock, wasn't it? Just shock, yeah, it was pure shock. So the Padres, man, they've got the work cut out for them out here, really cut out for them. Since Bill's last visit to X-Ray Company, the Marines have built this memorial garden for all the men who have lost their lives in this area. I think the, the reason, the reason we, we did this, did the crosses, did the sort of this area, um, like mostly it made me feel better. It made me feel like I was doing something after, after people got killed, um, and it gave the lads somewhere to come. I know quite a few lads have come up to me and said it's good to have somewhere just to come over and have five minutes on their own. So now, if you wish to come forward for a blessing or to receive the communion, please come ahead. Chris, the body of Christ, broken for you. Religion means different things to different people. That, I know that sounds obvious, but you'll find that people will, will attend masses like this and that wouldn't do it at home. It just makes them feel better, and anything that makes you feel better out here is a, it's a good thing. I can't really explain why, but it just makes you feel that, that little bit better. It's something, something to believe in. Lord God, whose command is over all and whose love never fails, 
I don't really think about who the Taliban are praying to, their beliefs are their beliefs, and what I believe is personal to me. They're, they're trying to do a job against us, and obviously we've got to try and do a job against them. I think that's that simple, lads, just come out here and try and get on with the job, get through it and then go home. Despite all the losses, X-ray Company is increasing the pressure on the Taliban. Major Maltby is briefing his men for a company strength patrol back into the territory where Marine Smith was shot two weeks ago. He has asked Bill to come along. X-ray Company group are to conduct a ground domination patrol to the desert body in order to disrupt enemy forces activity. Uh, medical, be prepared to receive casualties and prepare for murder if required. Always attend those orders groups just so I can get a, a feel for what's going on. Look on the map, look at the objectives. If we get lost, it's important to know where we're going. Obviously, if you honestly believe your life is in danger, call out for a client. Any questions on what we're trying to achieve? Clear. Clear. Basically, what we're doing is we're just starting our battle prep for tomorrow. Um, obviously, to make sure that uh, all the weapons are serviceable. Yeah, they're all good to go. The lads have been through drills yesterday, yeah, and they're all cooking on gas, as we like to say, silky smooth. And that's it. Rations, water, bullets and beans. Padre, everybody's always got to see the Padre. You know, I'll have him in my patrol any day. At the end of the day, he's God's best friend, isn't he? OK, last 10 rounds. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> Change barrel. It always surprises me, you know, we're four and a half months into a turn, the lads are still practising their drills. And uh, same, same, it's important for me to, to do my prayers, to read, uh, read my Bible and to, to keep in touch with God. It's so easy out here to let things slip. Yeah, You all set for tomorrow here? Yeah? yeah, I've just got to, you know what it is, just trying to keep up with the dust. What's the I think I'm slightly apprehensive about tomorrow. I'm nervous. Oh, I bet, you know, there, there's a lot of young lads out there are nervous. I bet there's a lot of corporals and stripies as well. But I know when we get back, you know, lads will say, oh, yeah, you were there. You, know, you, you stood alongside. I was thinking back before, you know, to, to Christmas when I first met you. Oh, yeah. And the, the, Oh, uh, carol service. Yeah. And <laughs> there was not many people there. <laughs> and then when you think now, how many people have uh, got to come back across from you? I've only got three left, so just going to look through. How many did you bring out? Uh, enough for every man. And, that, and that's all from lads asking you? Yeah, it's quite covert as well. <laughs> the lads will give it the old... It's like, it's like you're offering drugs, they're like... Going those combat crosses. <laughs> Would the chaplains like their men to be more devout? Would they want the ranks full of Christian soldiers? Having played football in a Christian league for a church, I don't think that'd be a very good idea at all. <laughs> to have one ideological belief, I think, in society, we're, we're, we're past that now. We're, we're postmodern. The belief in meta narratives. Oh, check out the long words. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it doesn't doesn't occur anymore. Ah! Dave, you've got to recognise there are other faiths. You've got to understand people have different journeys. The Crusades were long, long oh, centuries ago. Um, and, I, and I don't like horses, so you won't find me on one with a charger going down with my red cross emblazoned on my white thing. This is not a crusade. It's nowhere near. For Nigel, a key objective of his tour is to establish a relationship with local religious leaders. In Musakala, he is able, after months of trying, to meet with Mullah Dad Muhammad, the chief cleric and district governor of the area. I think for what we're doing here, uh, such, in, such interaction is, is vital. We can work together to achieve you know, the aims of peace, whatever the understandings are and the beliefs are. It, 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 that is the ultimate that we're after, uh, the peace. To become uh, what we call the priest, I have to visit our, our big religious leaders, which we call bishops. I then go to, to a way to a college for two or three years. Yeah. And then I've got to be with another priest for another two or three, perhaps four years. 
What, what's, what's the process for, for a mother? Asked on several occasions if it would be possible, you know, to meet. As in anything that we did in the area, uh, we had to be exceptionally careful. Um, you know, even if we offered clothes, colouring books, or whatever to the children, if the Taliban came into the area and saw that, it was to be taken as collaboration, the family would be killed, and, and you know, we had to be very, very careful what we were doing. If anybody got wind of that in the Taliban, well, it would have, it is, it's his, you know, it's his death sentence. <laughs> When I asked whether he was willing to meet others that followed me, and he said yes, you know, almost like bring it on, you know, it was a huge, huge courageous move on his part. And I suppose you could almost say it was, it, it was one of the highlights of, 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 my, of my tour. Nole, 6 a.m. Chaplain Bill Gates has been on patrol for two hours. Welcome to my parish. These are my parishioners, 4-5 Commando. It's very different from five years ago. When I was down in Weymouth looking after the Methodist churches down there. As it's beginning to get light now, the Taliban have got eyes on us. We listen to their, their radio, we can intercept what they're saying. And uh, from what we're picking up, they can see us. Right, Fergie Oz, obviously ICOM suggesting that they've got eyes on us, especially the vehicle and such, so uh, let's try and spot that digger if we can. are just searching the compounds, but there are a lot of finds throughout this uh, Sangin area. This is part of the patrol then to um, exploit and search the ground to uh, find the explosives. Are there two bikes moving in? There's another two, uh, right, another three right behind it. They've all got two blocks on. For the guys at the front, they're still doing their job. Every step can be something nasty, something unpleasant, an IED. I think it's important to, to be close by. Theologians will talk about this incarnational ministry. It's all about being alongside, being in the midst. And I think a lot of my work is not so much about what I say as being there. We were out on air patrol two weeks ago to this day. Basically, the uh, Taliban started firing. Um, unfortunately, we... Uh, took a casualty yeah. who uh, later on Dad. that day uh, sadly passed away. The lads seem to be quite resilient though. They, they seem yeah, to be... Uh... The thing is, you have a small memorial service uh, and then you start preparing to go back out on the ground. Yeah. yeah. Every time you come out, you just hope that obviously you get back to the fob with no casualties. Yeah, Roger, what I want you to do is uh, keep your Bravo firm at the moment. I'm going to move the Forza and Alpha call sign now uh, while the Bravo moves back to the uh, cache location. Yeah, the, uh, the blokes have found um, a small weapons cache down in a uh, derelict compound. Just search the surrounding area, just uh, waiting on the uh, EOD to come out so they can um, destroy that uh, cache. The 
there's been a, a, a call that's going to be blown in um, figures one, so we've got 60 seconds till it blows. I'd never claim to have all the answers, and as such, I think it's quite wrong to come out with trite, simplistic answers. For me, God is great, is vast, and is beyond comprehension. Paul writes, at the time, it's as if we look through a glass dimly, but when we get to glory, all will be revealed. And I really believe that. So I don't have all the answers. But for the lads, I do try and listen to what they're saying and then try and point them in, a, in the right direction. But there's no satisfactory, immediate answer to any of their questions. I found God to be good, and as such, I, I recommend him to the lads. I have been asked on many occasions, what, what, what am I doing in a fighting force? in an area where we, we're killing. This one's for the power drive. I have an understanding I'm not here to fight. I'm here as a spiritual person to give a moral level to those in command and, and the guys and girls on the ground. Um, I'm here for them. Not to necessarily condone war, but to try and bring peace and understanding. What does everyone have? Everyone else want a break? Yeah, I'll have a two, please, big man. I want to have six. Six. 22 steps, Jordan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, Padre. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs>